Well, today we will be taking a break from the book of Romans, and we'll be in the Old Testament looking at uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 121. Right? If you need a Bible, we have Bibles on that table uh, to my right. Uh, so just raise your hand and we can make sure um, that someone gets you one. So we'll be in Psalm 121. And we'll be looking at eight verses that's found in Psalm 121. I'll give you some time uh, to turn there. When you have it, say amen. So Psalm 121 reads this way. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. I want to speak to us this morning from this thing. God is our help. God is our help. Let's look to the Lord for his help so that he can give us understanding in this passage here this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for Psalm 121. Pray, God, that as we dive into your word, Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes. Help us to behold wondrous things in your word. I pray that your word would calm every fear, our anxieties, the burdens that we carry. Father, I pray that this psalm would be a great encouragement to us all as we live through difficult times. And I pray that we would leave out of here today rejoicing because you are our help and your help never fails. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as human beings, one of the things that we all share in common is the need for help. You see, we, we uh, go through this life, we encounter various situations, circumstances that leave us vulnerable at times, leaves us fearful, leaves us frustrated, we're left anxious. We're left always worrying. We're left fatigued, overworked. And as a result, we look for help. Depending on the severity of our situation, of the trial that we're going through, we cry out for help. You see, during hard times, naturally, we seek uh, rescue. We seek support. We seek aid, comfort, healing, advice. Now, I can be a forgetful person at times, but if my memory serves me correct, there's not one person walking this earth who doesn't need help. Humans are not self-sufficient. Humans are not as powerful as we want to believe. No matter the level of influence you have, no matter the authority that you have, no matter the, the amount of resources you have, we're weak. In and of ourselves, we're powerless. There's not one individual in this room or outside of this room that has the ability to sustain themselves. There's not one person in this room or outside of this room that has the, the ability to create something out of nothing. So in times of frustration, as you encounter difficult times, as you suffer, where do you look for help? Well, as the psalmist puts it in verse 1 of our text, he says, from where does my help come from? 
This is the question that we must ponder this morning. Where does your help come from? The psalmist, he gives us his answer in verse 2 of our text. He says that his help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, because of sin, we don't always look to God for help. In fact, if we're honest, most times God is our last resort. We foolishly believe that we can do things relying on our own strength. As sinful beings, we tend to look for help in all the wrong places. And we quickly find out that the thing or person that we look to for help, they don't have the ability, the the power to give us the help, the aid that we need. That thing or person doesn't provide true relief. It doesn't provide security. It doesn't provide stability. And because of this, we're left feeling more frustrated, more tired, more hopeless. How many times, just think about this, how many times have you experienced frustration, disappointment, shame, hopelessness? Too many, right? Because we look for help in all the wrong places. Maybe you're the type who looks within to yourself. You say, well, surely I can't let myself down. If I can't trust in no one else, surely I can trust in myself. But then you let yourself down. You disappoint yourself. Because you're not perfect. Or maybe you're the type who likes to escape your problems. So you, 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 try to, you, you try to escape them through things such as drugs, alcohol, pursuing pleasure, pornography, social media, maybe even exercise. But these things fail to give you the help that you're looking for. Or maybe you look to, you, you look to entertainment, video games. Binge watching movies, music, sports, but these things fail to deliver. Maybe you look to work, the pursuit of success, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of fame, but these things fail to help. What could it be that you put your trust in a person? Close friend, family member, maybe even a church member, pastor, or even a coworker. Yet all these people fail to help you. You see a theme here? Verse 1 of our text assumes that we all need help. So again, I ask you, where does your help come from? The main idea I want to communicate to us this morning from Psalm 121 is that God is able to help us at all times, no matter the situation. God is the faithful source of help. But we must have a right understanding of God's power because this will help us to trust him with our entire life. Psalm 121 is meant to encourage us to trust in God's ability to provide stability, to provide protection, to preserve us. It's meant to instill confidence in God, not in ourselves. It's meant for us to have an expectation that he will actually help us. So as you sit here today, will you trust God with your entire life? I don't care how small your trial is or how great it is. Will you trust God with everything? Look, church, I want us to walk out of here not being confident in ourselves, but in being confident in God. God wants us to walk out of here this morning being confident in him. So let me just highlight A few reasons from this text on why we can trust God to help us. And I'm going to give you, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you my outline right at the outset. So in verses 1 and 2, we see that we can trust God to help us because he is the creator. In verses 3 and 4, we see that we can trust God to help us because he gives us stability. Verses 5 and 6, we see that we can trust God to help us because he gives us protection. And then in the last two verses, verses 7 and 8, we see that we can trust God to help us because he preserves us. So let's look at the text. Psalm 121. It belongs to the group of psalms known as the Songs of Ascent. So that includes Psalm 120 all the way through to 134. As the Israelites were making their pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem to worship God in the temple, they sung these songs on the way to encourage them 
during the journey. You see, Jerusalem was, was seated up on a hill. So this journey wasn't easy by no stretch of the imagination. Where's Logan at? Logan Plass, raise your hand. You went to Israel not too long ago, right? So you know what I'm talking about, about the, the, the uphill, tra- uphill travel. So Israel is notorious for its rocky and slippery terrain. It was a dangerous road. And also during this journey, there was often a threat of danger from robbers and gangs, and not to mention the exhaustion and, and fatigue that comes from walking uphill on uneven terrain with the sun scorching down on you during the daytime and then with the uh, colder temperatures at night. In Psalm 121, we see the determination of the psalmist to trust in God to help him during this difficult journey. You see, this sort of determination and confidence come from firsthand experience that God is able to help. Do you possess this kind of confidence in God? Why do you think the psalmist was so confident in God? Well, it's because of who God is. And again, in verse 2 of our text, it tells us that he is the one who made heaven and earth. So this is the first reason why we can trust God. God is the creator. If we go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, the very first words we see recorded in the history of this world is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. To say that God created the heavens and the earth is to say that God created every single thing in this universe, seen and unseen. Who do you know that can create something out of nothing? Look, you can take the most creative mind, the most gifted human being, the most, the most resourceful, the wealthiest. You can line them all up, and yet none of them are able to create something out of nothing. This ability is only reserved for God the creator of heaven and earth. So let's follow the logic here. Since God has the creative power that made something out of nothing, surely he's able to give us aid when we encounter hardships. Surely he's able to give us help in our fight against sin and Satan. Surely he's able to give us aid when we're going through depression or mental health issues. Surely he's able to give us aid when our parents let us down. Surely he's able to give us help when our children let us down. Surely he's able to give us help when we're raising children, when our funds are low, when we lose a loved one, when we're dealing with marital problems, when our health is failing us, when we're discontent in life, when we're confused about life, when we're losing hope, when we're dealing with guilt and shame, when we need salvation. God is able to help. Now, if you're, if you're not a Christian, that means your greatest need in this life is to have your sins forgiven. Well, today, God is able to help with that. Your sins need to be forgiven by holy God. And the mistake that people always make is... They think that their good works are enough to have their sins forgiven. You see, there's no, there's no amount of good works that you can do to have your sins forgiven by God. This is only something that God has the ability to do. So I invite you to turn from your sins today and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you stand in need of today, on July 16th, 2023, and in the future, God is able to provide it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, reminds us of God's power. When it states this, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. When you take some time to reflect on your life and the challenges you face, ask yourself this question. Is there anything that's too hard for God? Now, if you was to put that question to me, I could give you a whole list of things that's too hard for me. Ask me to fix your car. I can't do it. Like, I'm just, I don't have that ability. 
My man Casey, I don't think Casey is here. I would refer you to Casey. Casey has his own garage, right? So for all your car problems, you can see Casey, all right? Right? But look, the point is, as humans, we all have limitations. That's just certain things that we, we can't do. That are, that there are certain things that are just impossible for us. But you see, what is impossible for man, the Bible tells us that all things are possible for God. And we can trust that God can do all things. We can trust in him to help us. So moving on to verses 3 and 4. And we're here in verses 3 and 4, we see that we can trust God because God gives us stability. So I work, if you don't know, I work in the physical therapy field. And I recently worked with a patient who, she, um, she had a fall. She lost her footing on the steps, and she fell on the steps. But thankfully, she didn't hurt herself too, too bad. Um, and look, I wasn't there, okay? So this didn't happen on my watch, okay? So you can trust me with your loved ones. I, I wasn't there. But like I said, she didn't have any serious injuries. But um, every time I would practice walking down the steps with her, you could just see the fear on her face. Like it, 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 it gripped her. She was, she was anxious, just, just very jittery, just fearful. She thought she would fall down the steps again. So what I would do to try to ease her fears, to, to, to give her confidence, I would place what is known as a gate belt or a transfer belt around her waist, right? And we do this to, to give the patient support and stability as we're, you know, as we're walking with them, or in this case, I was taking her down the steps. Now, she became more confident as we started practicing, you know, going down the steps. She became more confident because she knew I wasn't going to let her fall because I was giving her the stability and the support that she needed as I, as I was holding on uh, to the belt. You see, in life, we all look for stability, whether you're the patient who just had a fall and you, you're looking for stability as you're walking down the steps, whether you look for stability financially, spiritual stability, emotional stability, stability in marriage, stability at work, stability at school, stability in, in society. We all look for stability. As mentioned earlier, for those who were making their way to Jerusalem, the road was, remember, it was uphill. It was uneven terrain. It was a difficult road. Therefore, the traveler going to Jerusalem needed stability and support for the journey. In times of fear, uncertainty, or difficulty, we need stability. But where is this stability found? Well, looking at verses 3 and 4, it says this. He, talking about God, will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The psalmist had confidence that God was able to provide the stability needed to complete such a difficult journey. Regarding verse 3, one theologian stated this. He says, the sliding of the foot is a frequent description of misfortune. What misfortunes or afflictions are causing you to lose your footing in life today? What sort of problems, issues, setbacks have you suffered that is causing you to stumble? There's always times when we're prone not to trust God. That's our, default, that's our default reaction because faith is so unnatural. We may think to ourselves, as we, as we go through trials, we may think to ourselves, I don't know God. This trial that I'm going through is just too great. The journey through life, too challenging. God, surely you'll grow tired of all my problems. You'll grow weary and, and send me away if I keep looking to you for help, for stability, for support. God, I'm afraid you might even forget about me. Verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 121 is meant to silence that kind of thinking. We serve a God who won't let our foot be moved because God never slumbers. He never sleeps. You guys remember the story back in 1 Kings chapter 18. And the prophet, the prophet Elijah, 
he's, uh, he, ha- he has this, like, this showdown with the false prophets of Baal. So the challenge was false prophets of Baal and Elijah, they would each put a sacrifice on the altar. They would call on their God. The prophets of uh, Baal would call on Baal, and Elijah would call on Yahweh. And whatever God answered by fire and consumed the sacrifice would prove to be the true and living God, the God that deserved to be worshipped, right? So as the story goes, they lay their sacrifices down, and the prophets of Baal, they call on their God, right? Problem is, their God never answers. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27. It says this, and Elijah, he actually mocks them during this time. It says this. This is so funny to me. It says, and at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Elijah, he calls on Yahweh, and he answers by fire, and he consumes the sacrifice revealing to be the true God. So as we go back to our text, if you notice, the psalmist, he makes a point to emphasize the fact that God, the true God, Yahweh, doesn't slumber nor sleep. This means that he watches tirelessly over us. He never ceases to stop watching over us. He's watching over you right now. He knows what you're going through. He knows your struggles. He knows your limitations. He knows your fears. He knows what keeps you up at night. Look, God doesn't take any days off. Doesn't take PTO. Doesn't take sick time. All right? He's always watching. And he has the power to stabilize you as you go through difficult times. Now, look, if you don't believe me, if you're still not convinced... At least believe the words of the writer of Hebrews. He says this about Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds, meaning he stabilizes the universe by the word of his power. The same power that upholds the universe by Christ's hand is the same power that upholds us that stabilize us, and we have access to that power. And God is able to stabilize you, and he will stabilize you for the entirety of your life. So we can trust that God can and will stabilize us. So let's look at verses 5 and 6. And here we see we can trust God to help us because God gives us protection. A few years ago, me and my wife, we decided to travel to Las Vegas during the month of August. Now, let me give you a warning. If, you, if you're thinking about doing that, don't do it. That is the hottest time of year in Las Vegas, in the desert. I really like, till this day, I just don't know what we were thinking. No, you know what? I know what it was. See, that's the cheapest time because it's so hot. Nobody really likes to go during that time. And then we had this bright idea during the daytime to walk the Las Vegas Strip. Had to be temperatures ranging anywhere from 110 to probably over 120 degrees, right? Sun was beating down on us. If you've been in the sun for long periods of time, you know the feeling of just like being exhausted, fatigued drain. Then there's also something known as a heat stroke, right, which can cause death. Now, let's say if we were, if we travel to, let's say, a colder place, where there are also dangers associated with the cold, right? Think of frostbite, risk of cardiac issues like heart attack and stroke, as well as risk of respiratory issues. My point is this, in both scorching temperatures or in cold temperatures, there's a certain danger that is present. You see, as the people of Israel were traveling on the way to Jerusalem, they had to deal with the danger of the sun during the day, and at night, 
They had to deal with the, not only the colder temperatures brought forth by the moon, but also the present threat of evil influences, such as robbers at nighttime. Spiritually speaking, what dangers are you currently facing today? Spiritually speaking, I think the greatest threat that we all face is the constant attacks from our great foe, Satan. The Bible describes Satan as being like a roaring lion going around seeking whom he may devour. Now, I don't want to hurt your feelings this morning, but I have to be honest. If you think you can withstand the attacks of Satan relying on your own strength, you are sadly mistaken this morning. We are all weak people in and of ourselves. Now, I know this goes against everything that the world tells you. The world says, hey, you're strong. Believe in yourself. You can do anything. I don't want us to be set up for failure this morning in our fight against Satan, in our fight against sin. You see, if the people of God were going to have success as they traveled to Jerusalem, they, had, they needed to be assured of protection day and night. On our journey to heaven, we need to be assured of protection day and night. Where does one find this kind of protection? Look, the U.S. government can't give you this kind of protection. The BPD cannot give you this kind of protection. The 2,000 Ravens defense cannot give you this kind of protection. Right, Tim? So where does one find this kind of protection? Verses 5 and 6 of our text read, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Just what is the psalmist getting at in these verses, verses 5 and 6? Are we to take these verses literally? I like how James Montgomery Boyce explains it. Verses 5 and 6, he says this, What the psalmist really means, though in figurative language, is that nothing either of the day or night can harm us if God is keeping guard. He goes on, he says, God is our covering against every calamity. He is our shade against the visible pearls of the day, as well as the hidden pearls of the night. End quote. Oh, church, don't you see that God is always with us, keeping God of us no matter the time of day, no matter how great the danger we face. You see, as a person's shadow is always with them, so is God, always with us, with his people, protecting us. I understand now why Martin Luther wrote these words. He says, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Brothers and sisters, God is our protection and our defense against the troubled waters and storms of life. Trust him, church. He's able. So we can trust God, right, as we said, because In verses 1 and 2, because he's the creator, right? Verses 3 and 4, we said we can trust God because he gives us stability. Verses 5 and 6, we said we can trust God because he gives us protection. Let's look at the last two verses, verses 7 and 8. We can trust God to help us because he preserves us. You see, when facing troubles, one of the questions I believe we often ask ourselves is, will I complete this journey that I'm on. This question had to be on the mind of the people of Israel as they journeyed to Jerusalem under these conditions. So I ask you, will at the end of your life, will you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, or will you hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. As you face an uphill battle, as you receive a terminal diagnosis, as your life seems to be falling apart, as your support system fails you, will you have enough fortitude to complete the journey? Brothers and sisters, the protection that God promises us in verses 5 and 6, it extends to the entirety of our life. The psalmist says in verses 7 and 8, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You see, in verse 7, 
A better translation for, for evil would be harm or trouble or calamity. So we could say the Lord will keep you from all trouble, from all calamity, from all harm. This is something that we must understand. God never promised his people that they wouldn't have to endure hardships. Please get that out of your mind right now. In fact, he says the very opposite in his word. Let me just highlight a couple of scriptures to testify to this. Acts chapter 14, verse 22 states that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let's not forget the words of Jesus himself when he states in John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Oh, church, although the journey we're on is a slippery one, our story doesn't end with hardship and despair. Our future is not bleak. God promises that we won't be overtaken by no amount of suffering, by no amount of calamity, by no amount of pain. In Psalm 121, we see the emphasis on God being able to keep us. That's mentioned over like five, over five times. In other words, brothers and sisters, God is able to pre preserve us as we go through our trials. You will pass through the fire but you will not be overtaken by. Think of the hardest thing that you had to endure up to this point in your life. Now, let me ask you this. Why are you still here in your right mind? Why haven't you given up yet? Why do you still have strength? It's because God is preserving you. One biblical uh, scholar once stated, he says, although neither the church nor any member thereof has any promise that affliction and temptation shall never come. Yet the word of God makes it certain that no believer shall perish therein. Our trials, our tribulations, our sufferings, these things won't overtake us because God is preserving us. You see, when faced with a difficult task, naturally, I think we gain confidence when we see someone else like us going through similar trials and tribulations. Or maybe we might see them going through an even greater trial. Yet we see them coming out victorious. I think that's a great encouragement for us. You see, many years later, after Psalm 121 was written, there was one who would come and travel a difficult road. This road was marked by suffering of the worst kind. In fact, I think the, the difficulties that was present on this road have never been du uh, duplicated. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ traveled on the hill known as Golgotha or Mount Calvary. He was exhausted, weighed down by the cross, of, by, by the cross that he was carrying, weighed down by our sin, weighed down by our shame and guilt, weighed down by the wrath of God that he was under. If you were a bystander that day and you were observing Christ carry that cross, the question that probably would have came to your mind is this. How was he able to endure such hostility, such hatred, such persecution, such torture, such pain? Well, family, Jesus was able to endure such suffering because God the Father preserved his life. Ultimately, he died, but three days later, the same power that preserved his life when he was on this earth was the same power that raised him from the dead. And now this Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. And the invitation remains for us all today. Turn from your sins. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. While today it's today. You see the stability, the protection, the, uh, the preservation that we see here in Psalm 121 
These promises are for Christians. If you're not a Christian, that means your troubles, your pains, your trials will overtake you. They will destroy you. So place your trust in Christ today. You see, the Father kept the Son from all evil. The Father kept his life. The Father kept his going out and coming in this time forth and forevermore. So as I close, let me read these last two verses. In your hearing again, and hopefully this will provide us with confidence in God. Psalm 121, verses 7 and 8, read this way. And can we stand? Psalm 121, verse 7. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for never failing us, never disappointing us. We thank you for always being available to us. So, Father, I pray that you would continue to give us the courage. Lord, give us the grace we need to always look to you for help. And I pray, Father, that as you continue to give us the support we need to make it through this life, Father, I pray that our confidence would just continue to grow in you. And I pray, God, that by your grace, Lord, we would trust you with our entire life. May we not fear. May we not be anxious. But may we look to you. We thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.